It's good to be with you this evening, and we'll talk about logic and the Christian worldview. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. And I want to begin by asking you to think to yourself, how would you respond if somebody said the following? We know evolution's a fact because bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. Or how would you respond if somebody said, you're just a Christian because you were raised in a Christian home. If you were raised by Muslims, you'd probably be a Muslim. Or if somebody said, the Bible teaches that God causes lightning and rain, there's the verses, but we now understand that these things are due to natural forces. So you're wrong, you Christians. Well, I have to tell you, these are all examples of fallacies, errors in reasoning. That's what a fallacy is, it's a common error in reasoning. And the study of logic can prevent or expose such errors and is indispensable in the field of apologetics, the defense of the Christian faith. And so I think this is something that will be absolutely helpful, perhaps the most helpful thing to you in your life apart from salvation. <laughs> it's really helpful. What is logic? A proper or reasonable way of thinking about or understanding something. That's, the dic that's one dictionary definition. Another is a science that deals with the principles and criteria of validity of inference and demonstration, the science of formal principles of reasoning. It's correct thinking. Logic is correct thinking or the study of correct thinking. And so that's what you learn when you learn logic. To be logical is to think correctly. To think rationally, to think logically, is to think in a way that's consistent with God's thoughts. But wait a minute, Dr. Lau, you just said it's to think correctly. Yes, God's, God always thinks correctly. And so if you're going to think correctly, you need to think in a way that's consistent with his character. We can't think exactly like God because he's infinite and we're finite, but we're made in his image and we have the capacity to think in a way that is consistent with his character. And it's something we can practice, it's something we can learn, it's something we can get better at. Everything that you think that is true is something that God also thinks, okay? All truth exists in the mind of God. God's mind determines what's true. Our, our minds are different. Our minds are the recipients of some of that truth. And of course, we can be mistaken about things. Some of our beliefs are false. Rational thinking really is biblical thinking. It's thinking in a way that's consistent with God's character. So to be rational is to have good self-consistent reasons for our beliefs. You say, you know, it's to think correctly, but who decides what is correct thinking? God does. It's his mind that determines truth. It's his mind that created the universe and upholds it. Now the purpose of education, originally, <laughs> was to train people to become rational to have good reasons for our beliefs and to abandon beliefs that have no good reasons. Uh, sadly, most education today, what is called education, is not that. Which is why in most public schools, they don't teach logic anymore. I think there's a reason for that. But it's interesting, because that really is the primary purpose of education, to think correctly. And the one class that really is all about that is not taught anymore in most public schools, something to think about. There are two enemies of rationality. Two things, sometimes it's easier to, to describe what to do by saying, just don't do these two things and you're good. <laughs> two enemies of rationality. If you can avoid these two, you're rational. Arbitrariness and inconsistency. Arbitrariness, not having a, a reason for what you believe. And inconsistency, having reasons that contradict each other, that don't go well together. Those are enemies of rationality. Let's take a look at each one. Arbitrary, to be by definition, it's not based on reason or evidence, not based on reason or evidence. But to, remember the definition of rational though is based on facts or reason if you look it up in the dictionary. So to have arbitrary beliefs is by definition irrational. Now it's okay to be arbitrary about preferences when you picked out what shirt you wanted to wear today and you say, oh, I just like this one. That's an arbitrary choice and that's fine because it's not a belief about something. But when you believe something, you better have a good reason for it. Because if you don't, it's likely to be wrong. A rational person has good reasons for his or her beliefs. Beliefs with no good reasons behind them are necessarily irrational. They're not necessarily false, but they're likely to be false. Because there's a lot more wrong answers than true ones, right? If I ask what's two plus two, and you just pick an answer arbitrarily, if you don't have a good reason for it, since there's only one right answer, Four, and there's an infinite number of wrong answers. If you picked an answer at random, the chances of you being right are almost zero, aren't they? Now, children tend to be very arbitrary. They're irrational, and we expect that from little children. They don't have good reasons for their beliefs. 
right? They think there's a monster in the closet. Do they have good reasons to believe there's a monster in the closet? Of course not. They're, they're kids, they don't have good reasons for their beliefs. Furthermore, they believe that pulling the sheets over their head will protect them from the monster in the closet. And when they're alive the next morning, it must have worked. Now that is not rational thinking. And we expect that from little children. If an adult were to behave that way, we'd say that that person probably has a mental problem. Okay? Adults are supposed to be rational. As we grow up, we're supposed to become rational. We're supposed to learn to have good reasons for our beliefs and to relinquish beliefs that do not have good reasons behind them. So hopefully you've changed your mind about a few things as you've grown up. And hopefully the things you believe now are things that have good reasons behind them. So why avoid arbitrariness in our thinking? If a belief is arbitrary, then there's literally no good reason to believe it. By definition, that's what it means. You don't have a good reason. The point of a rational argument when you're debating with someone is to show that there are good reasons to believe the conclusion that you've drawn. And thus to be arbitrary is to give up the debate. It's to be irrational. We, and we have a moral obligation to be rational. That's something I'll come back to a little bit later. So if somebody says, I think, whatever, they've got some belief, I think there's life in outer space, and you should too. The natural question you should ask is, why? Why do you think that? Why should I think that? If you say, oh, I don't have a reason, then you say, well, then I don't have a reason to believe it, do I? It's, it's arbitrary. It's not worth consideration. The other enemy of, of correct reasoning is inconsistency. To be inconsistent is to, have con is to contain incompatible elements, having parts that disagree with each other. And that is not a good thing because in inconsistent beliefs are necessarily false because of what we call the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction says if you take a proposition and its negation, the, co the combination of those two is always false. A and not A is always false. So if I said my car's in the parking lot and it's not the case that my car's in the parking lot, that's false. Okay, but assuming they're, they're meaning A and not A in the same sense and at the same time. Sometimes things can change over time, obviously. The law of non-contradiction is rooted in the nature of God. God doesn't deny himself. All truth is in the mind of God, therefore truth will not contradict truth. It has to be the case because of the nature of God. I'm going to come back to that point too because that's powerful when you realize laws of logic are rooted in God's character. Why avoid inconsistency in our thinking? Well, it's pretty clear if you have two inconsistent beliefs, at least one of them is false. Two beliefs that are contrary to each other, at least one of them is false. And so, and the sum of them therefore is false, right? You combine, if you combine a true belief with a false belief, th this plus this, the combination is, is false. So inconsistent thinking is contrary to the nature of God. God's self-consistent. He doesn't deny himself according to 2 Timothy 2.13. Uh, it's, it's explicitly unbiblical. And we'll take a look at some examples of this. Take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians 1.18. Paul says, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Paul's saying, we don't, we don't contradict ourselves. We don't say this and not this, right? And he even gives the reason, because God is faithful. And we're to emulate God's character. So we shouldn't be consistent. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be inconsistent. We should be consistent. Uh, Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate, hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. They were inconsistent. They were trying to worship two gods. That makes no sense. You can't have two almighty beings. Think about it. It's not possible. Hypocrisy is the biblical word for inconsistency. Hypocrisy is a specific type of inconsistency where your words do not match your actions. And Jesus was not a fan of hypocrisy in his earthly ministry. You hypocrites, he said to the religious leaders of his time. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching, the doc teaching, the doctrines, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And so they, they say, yeah, they, they praise me, they say they worship me, but they don't do that. They teach man's doctrines, that, which are often contrary to God's law. Their heart's far away from me. So what I want you to take away this evening is that every Christian should strive to be rational. I'm going to give you three reasons this evening why we should, be, why we should study logic, why we should try to get sharper at this every day. First of all, we have a moral obligation to be rational. It's not, it's not optional for a Christian. It's not like, well, like you can be or not. No, you, you need to be rational. It's a sin to not be. I'll show you the verses that indicate that. Rationality has many practical benefits. Generally, your life will go better if you learn to use your brain properly. Yeah. And then it's essential in apologetics. It really is. If you want to defend the Christian faith, it's very helpful to know something about how to think properly. That's more important than knowing lots of scientific facts. I'm all for scientific facts, I'm a scientist, I like them. 
but it's better to know how to think. So let's start with the first one. We, we do have a moral obligation to be rational. Why is that? Because God is rational. He is truth. His mind is truth. Jesus corresponds perfectly to the mind of God. That's why he can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is rational, and we are made in his image and are commanded to emulate his character. Ephesians 5.1, we're to be imitators of God. Genesis 1.27, we're made in the image of God. We're to be like him. We're to have a philosophy that is according to Christ, according to Colossians 2.8, not according to the principles of the world. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we're to take captive every thought and do obedience to Christ. Our thinking needs to match God's thinking in as much as is possible on a creaturely level. Come now, God says, and let us reason together. Yes, God is very pro-reasoning, very pro-reasoning. We're supposed to base our thinking on his word because it's ultimate truth, and we're supposed to draw logical conclusions from that. Uh, when people do not use their brain properly, God is not pleased with that. He says, for my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children and have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. It's interesting that God actually connects stupidity with evil. It's kind of interesting. Not that they're exactly the same, but there's a tendency there. Because, I mean, you can know to do something right and, and do wrong anyway, but still, there is a connection there. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. This is kind of interesting. I love this passage. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Uh, God's telling us the problem in verse 8. He actually gives the solution first. The problem in verse 8 is that our thinking does not line up with God's thinking. Our ways do not, our actions do not line up with God's character. That's the problem. What's the solution? Repent. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Turn away from those and return to the Lord. And what, what will God do? He will have compassion. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God will forgive that sin. And it is a sin to think in a way that's contrary to God's character. But we, we can repent from that, and God will pardon us. And it's interesting, too, because verse 8 indicates that there is this disparity between the way we think and the way God thinks. And, and lest in our hubris we say, yes, I know, there, I know we disagree, God, but maybe you should change your thinking to match mine. Then he gives the next verse. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, God's saying, no, no, my thinking is so superior to yours. You, 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 no, it doesn't make sense for me to try and turn around to your foolish way of thinking. And, and at first, this might seem contradictory, because how, is it, how can we turn to God and start thinking like him and behaving like him if his thoughts are as high, high as the heaven is above the earth, which as an astrophysicist, I assure you, is very high. <laughs> How can, we, how can we make sense of this? The way I like to picture it, you can, you can imagine this spotlight, this beam coming down maybe from a distant quasar, okay? And it's, it's, you can never possibly reach the source of that light beam, but you can stand in the, the beam and then you can, you can see around you. In God's light, we have light. So we can't ever reach God's level, but we can stand in, in his light, as it were, and then we'll have light. That's a biblical theme. We're not to be as the horse or mule. Why? Because they don't have any understanding whose traffics include a bit and bridle to hold them in check, otherwise they will not come near you. You know, you can put a bit in the horse's mouth and you can turn it and he'll go that way. You can turn it that way and he'll go that way. God says, don't be like that. Somebody comes along and tells you, you go this way and you just go, no, use your brain. Think about it first. Think about, is what this person telling me consistent with God's character? If it is, then I should consider it. But if not, I'm not gonna go that way just because they're pushing me that way. Animals do that. Humans are supposed to be better than that because we're made in God's image. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised against the knowledge of God and are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. A lot of apologists like to use that verse. That's a great verse to use. They, they tend to focus on the first part. We're destroying speculations. We like that. Casting down arguments that exalt themselves up against God. But the key to the first part is the second part, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought captive to the obedience of Christ that's interesting. That's quite a challenge for us. Because if you think of all the things you thought about today, how many of them were obedient to Jesus Christ? Do you have some runaway thoughts? That's, that's a challenge for us, isn't it? Because we're, we're sinners by nature. Since we're commanded to pattern our thoughts after God, you see in the verses, to fail to be rational is a sin. When we, when we fail to think correctly, when we fail to use our brain the way God has instructed us to use it, that is sin. 
And so there should be an obligation on us to say, you know, I, I want to honor God by thinking correctly, by learning more about how to think correctly. That's very honoring to God. Not in an attempt to earn salvation. You can't earn your salvation. It's God's gift to you, received by faith. It's God's grace. But out of gratitude for salvation, I think we ought to honor our God with our thought life. So we do have a moral obligation to be rational. Rationality has many practical benefits. Learning to think rightly will help you in life. It really will. And I just, you know, just some of the things that off the top of my head, thinking rationally makes us more likely to believe things that are true and true beliefs affect better decisions. Uh, yes, if you're thinking properly, you're gonna tend to, um, you're gonna tend to have actions that tend to be in line with that. There was the show back uh, decades ago, there was the old Superman show, with the old one with George, George Reed, and uh, uh, after that show aired, some, some children would get a cape and they'd jump off of their house and they were injured because of that, because they thought they could fly like Superman. And they had to, they had to uh, in one episode, there was one episode where he said, now remember, only Superman can do things Superman does. <laughs> Uh, just to get kids to think a little bit. But you see, if they had thought properly, they're thinking, wait a minute, this is a fictional show. Now, we, we would expect, we expect kids to do stupid things because they're not rational. But my point is, they could have avoided injury if they'd been thinking properly. So obviously, the, the, the better you think about things, the more you use your brain properly, the better your life in general is going to be. And that's not exceptionless, but it's generally true. Thinking rationally reduces our susceptibility to sophisms and other errors. The sophism is something that is, it sounds kind of persuasive, but it's, it's fallacious, it's wrong. It's a, a, a rhetorical suggestion. You, you think of a, um, maybe a lawyer who's not so ethical and who's trying to persuade the jury to something that maybe he even knows isn't true, okay? And that he might use a sophism, something that would tend to trick people uh, if you know something about logic, you're going you're gonna to be much more aware of that tactic when it comes up, and you're going to say, I'm not going to be fooled by that. I can tell you a lot of advertisements or commercials on television that use sophisms to try and push people to do something or to buy a particular product. I'm not saying all commercials are wrong. It's okay to advertise, but you need to be able to analyze that and think, okay, let me think that through. Is that a good reason to get that product? Thinking rationally helps us in matters of science to judge between competing models. A lot of times scientists will look at the same evidence and they'll draw different conclusions about what it means and we'll have to think through, okay, why, why are they drawing different conclusions and what is this evidence, what's most consistent with it? Sometimes you can't get a conclusive uh, decision, right? Because not all logic is deductive. Not all logic uh, ends up with a conclusion that's absolutely guaranteed to be true. Sometimes it's probabilistic. You say, well, given the evidence, it's more likely that this is true. That's fine. It, inductive reasoning is a gift that God's given us where we can make estimates as to what's most likely to be true, and logic will help you do that. Thinking rationally will help us to distinguish between genuine science and pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is something that sounds sciency. It uses, it uses scientific terminology, but there's, it hasn't followed the scientific method. There's no experiment. There's no observation. There's no testable, repeatable predictions. And uh, I would argue a lot of evolution is that way. And I, I've criticized creationists, too. There are creationists who have said things that are just wrong. And, and they, they say, you know, according to our research, and I'm like, you haven't done any research. You've stated your opinion. And it's wrong. <laughs> and here's the actual evidence that shows that it's wrong. So thinking rationally will bring increased knowledge, wisdom, happiness, and blessings, according to Scripture. There's the verses. That's just one section. Hmm. That's a good reason to think rationally, to think truthfully. Thinking rationally will greatly aid our evangelism and our call to make disciples of all nations. If you're using your brain properly, it will help you to communicate well, help you to communicate the gospel, maybe to be more persuasive in the way that you, you know, we want to urge people to receive Christ as Savior, knowing that it's ultimately up to God. We can't make anybody be saved, but we can present things in a way that's perhaps better if we think better. And thinking rationally is crucial to a proper understanding of Scripture and can help us avoid heresy. Oh, yeah. Uh, heresies, people that, that deny some essential truth of Christianity, uh, most of those can be traced back to an error in reasoning, a logical fallacy. And I thought I'd give you one example of this. It's not one that I come across a lot, but I have heard this before because some people 
Well, let, let me give you the example here. John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29, Jesus is speaking. He says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Okay, so he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about some people are resurrected. Those people who did the good deeds are resurrected to life. They get to spend, you know, they get to go to heaven. They get to spend eternity with God. Those who committed the evil deeds, resurrection of judgment. Oh, so they, they're condemned to hell. And some people reading this verse and not thinking logically would say, well, see, this is teaching a gospel of works. Because those people who did good, they get to go to heaven. Those people who committed the evil, they go to hell. So see, there you go. It's good works that get you into heaven. That is a logical fallacy. It has a name. It's called the cum hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. That's it. That's a Latin phrase. It means with this, therefore because of this. This is the error of assuming that because two things go together, that A is the cause of B. When in fact, it might be B that's the cause of A, or it might be C that's the cause of both A and B. Just because two things go together doesn't mean one caused the other or the other caused the one. You gotta think about it. It is true that good deeds correspond with eternal life. Jesus was clear about that. Evil deeds correspond with eternal condemnation. But do good deeds cause or lead to salvation? And the answer is no, and we have plenty of scriptures that teach that. Salvation is by grace through faith and not works, and the Bible is very clear about that in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. But salvation causes good deeds. Those people who are saved want to do good. First, the entire book of 1 John is about that. It's about, you know, if, you're, if you say that yet you know him, but you, don't, but you practice evil, you don't know him, right? People who are saved will want to do good, and therefore they'll go to heaven, not because of the deeds, but because they're saved. The deeds follow salvation. And those who are not saved, even though it might look like they're doing things that are good, they're never doing it with the right motive to please God. So in any case, you can see how these things go together. Correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things go together doesn't mean one caused the other. It could mean it's the reverse. So if you know something about logic, your theology will improve. It really will. I've, I've thought, there are certain scriptures I've thought through, and then after learning logic, I've thought through, and I thought, you know what, my understanding of that is wrong. I need to rethink that a little bit, and it's, it's been very helpful to me. God expects us to do that. We're not to reason in place of God's word. We're to use God's word as a foundation and reason from it and build our theology from God's inerrant word, recognizing that our, our thinking is sometimes errant. So we have a moral obligation to be rational. Rationality has many practical benefits. And then this third one, which is probably what you really wanna hear, is that rationality is essential in apologetics. Uh, it will really help your defense of the faith to know something about logic and to know logical fallacies, by the way, because people who criticize Christianity do so using logical fallacies, either that or a false premise. I'm gonna split this into, into two subsections. Uh, first of all, it's good, it, rash, rationality will help you in apologetics. Learning logic will help you in apologetics because arguments against the Bible are always inherently fallacious. There's not a good argument against scripture. And that should go without saying. But people sometimes get stumped because they think, well, how, how do you answer this one? They're always fallacious. They either commit an, a logical fallacy, an error in reasoning from one proposition to the next, or they start from a false premise. And either one of those makes the argument unreliable. And so if you, if you understand something about logic and you know something about logical fallacies, and yes, it is good to study logical fallacies, errors in reasoning, so you don't commit them. And so you can recognize them when other people do. You do that, it's really gonna help. You're gonna be able to spot them and you can gently say, to your friend, well, I'm sorry, this is that, what you just said is the fallacy of such and such, and let me show you how that works. You need to do it graciously, but it's very helpful, very, very helpful. And then B, uh, rationality presupposes the Christian worldview. Now, that's something that most people haven't thought about, but it's powerful. And that's something, by the way, if you come uh, to the sessions tomorrow morning, I'm gonna talk about that and the ultimate proof of creation. I'll do a little bit of it tonight, because it's important. You can't have logic apart from the Christian worldview. I'll come back to that. Let's start with A. Arguments against the Bible are inherently fallacious. The ones that I mentioned earlier and some other ones that I'll throw in. Somebody says, why are you creationists against science? That's a logical fallacy. That's called the fallacy of the complex question. Com the complex question that was when you phrase a question such that it assumes an unwarranted conclusion. Okay, so why are you, wait a minute, we're not against science. I do have a PhD in science. I'm not against it. <laughs> I wasted a lot of years if I'm against it. Um, 
Yeah, so we're not against science. See, the, it's called a complex question because it should be divided into two. First of all, are you creationists against science? And then, if so, why? Should be divided. Ah. And uh, in, a, in a courtroom, they're not allowed to ask. Lawyers are not supposed to, anyway, ask complex questions. And they could object and say, that's a complex question. You divide it. Because, it, you know, it's, it's, it's the old, you know, do you still beat your wife? Or have you stopped beating your wife? Oh, you've stopped, okay. I mean, how do you answer that? Either way, it assumes something that is, is, un, is unwarranted. So uh, how about this one? Either you believe the Bible or you accept the scientific method. Uh, I believe the Bible and I accept the scientific method, although only one of those two is infallible, and it ain't the scientific method. Um, this is a bifurcation fallacy. Bifurcation fallacy is when you falsely assume that there are only two options that are mutually exclusive. I could say, actually, my friend, I, I do believe that the scientific method has merit because it's based on biblical principles like uniformity in nature, that God upholds things in a consistent way for our benefit, that God made our minds rational and our senses able to probe the universe. That's why we can do science, because of the Christian worldview. But it's a bifurcation fallacy to say it must be A or B. Always think that through. If somebody says hey, you're either this or that, think, think through, is there a third option? Because a lot of times there is. And so you, I always say D, none of the above. How about this one? The Bible teaches that God causes lightning and rain. I mentioned this one earlier. But we now understand that these things are due to natural forces. We understand what causes rain. When the temperature drops below the dew point, the air can't hold the moisture, and it rains. Of course, that's not, that's not God. Uh, actually, that's a bifurcation fallacy. I realize that lightning and rain are due to natural forces, but that's not an alternative to God's power. That is God's power. You see, natural forces are simply the name we give to the way that God normally upholds his creation. God's the one that's ultimately causing the atoms to move the way they do. And so God does cause lightning and rain, but he uses what we would call natural forces to do it. God ordains not only the ends, but also the means. That's not a problem in the Christian worldview. That's a feature. And I would point out then to my, the person who challenged me with this, I'd say, in your worldview, how, how can you have laws of nature? That doesn't even make sense. If, if nature's just random chance, why would it obey laws? Right? Laws of nature are, 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 are law-like because there's a mind behind them. God controls the universe in a consistent way, and he does that for our benefit. And it's logical because God's logical. Keep that in mind. Natural laws are not a replacement for God's power. They're an example of God's power. They're the way he normally acts. Does God have to do it that way? No, he's God. He can do what he wants. If God wants to suspend the laws of physics for a while and do something extraordinary, he can do that. That's not a problem. He can turn water into wine. It's not a problem. But normally the way he does things is, is in a way that is consistent for our benefit. And he's promised us certain cycles in nature, like the day and night cycle in Genesis uh, 8 22, God promises that the seasons and the day and night cycle will continue as long as the earth remains. So I know that the sun will rise tomorrow. I can, I can guarantee you that, okay? Because I have a promise from God. And that's what allows me to do science. Somebody says, we know evolution is a fact because bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. This is an equivocation fallacy, the fallacy of shifting the meaning of the word. The word that shift meaning is the word evolve or evolution which can just mean change in a generic sense. Well, we all agree things change. There's no doubt about that. Animals today are not exactly the same as they were at creation, right? But that doesn't mean they've evolved in, in the sense of from a common ancestor. They've remained the same kinds. Dogs have always been dogs and will always be dogs. And so the fact that you see things change does, in a generic sense does not prove a specific type of change, the Darwinian type. So this is, again, equivocation fallacy because you're using the same word in two different senses. I know evolution's true, by which they mean Darwinian evolution, because we see evolution in the sense of dogs becoming different breeds of dogs. Two different things. Two different things. Don't fall for that. Here's, here's one. Creationists do not believe that animals change at all. That's an example of a straw man fallacy. Right? That's where you misrepresent the position of your opponent and then show how easy it is to knock down that silly position. Because it's easy to show that animals change. They're not identical to their ancestors. We know that. You can get, even get different species. You can get speciation. But that's not what creationists teach. That's a misrepresent, misrepresentation of what creationists teach. We do believe animals change within kinds. We don't think that lizards become birds. But we do agree with speciation and different breeds and different breeds of dogs. See, a straw man fallacy you misrepresent your opponent, you show how easy it is to, to refute that ridiculous position 
but if, if he were up against an actual creationist and what we actually taught, he might find that more difficult to refute. Somebody says, you're just a Christian because you were raised in a Christian home. If you were raised by Muslims, you'd probably be Muslim. Now that's interesting because there's some truth to that. And a lot of Christians find that difficult to refute. But if you know something about logic, you realize it is a fallacy. That's called a circumstantial ad hominem fallacy. A circumstantial ad hominem is where you dodge the argument by pointing out the person's circumstances or motivations. Huh. So somebody who said, uh, well, you're just for higher gasoline prices because you work at a gas station. You'll get paid more. That may be true, but that doesn't mean his argument's false. He might have made a really good argument for higher gas prices. I don't know what it would be, but hypothetically. Just because you're motivated to argue for a position doesn't mean your position is wrong. Just because you've been blessed by, by parents who taught you the truth doesn't mean it's not the truth, does it? Really, this objection is like saying, well, you just believe in the multiplication table because you were taught it in school. Now, it is true that I believe in the multiplication table and I was taught it in school, but that doesn't mean I don't have some really good reasons to continue to believe in the multiplication table, like it works, right? So the fact that, I'm, that I've come to believe something in a particular way has no bearing on my argument for that particular thing, none whatsoever. It is true that I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful. I was, I was brought up in a Christian home and that, that certainly helped. But that doesn't mean that Christianity is false. Not at all. It's a circumstantial ad hominem. A person's motivations or circumstances for making the argument are utterly irrelevant to the validity of the argument. Utterly irrelevant. But you can see how people would be fooled by that because there's some truth in the statement. It just doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that Christianity is false or even that it's less likely to be true. Uh, somebody says, well, creationists are not real scientists. I've been told that so many times, I feel like I should turn in my PhD. But uh, this is a no true Scotsman fallacy. That's where you protect a position from rebuttal by incorrectly redefining the terms. What's the definition of a scientist? Someone who does science, somebody who follows the scientific method. Do creationists do that? Yeah, some of us anyway, yeah. See, but adding the real there, they're trying to protect that claim from counter-argument. And, and the, this, it gets its name from the uh, example that was first used of this uh, fallacy in, in terms of identifying it. Uh, somebody says, uh, well, well, no Scotsman puts sugar in his porridge. And somebody provides a counter-example. Not true. Angus is a Scotsman, and he puts sugar in his porridge. And the comeback it is, well, uh, no, no true Scotsman puts sugar in his porridge. But the problem is there's nothing in the definition of a Scotsman that has anything to do with whether or not they put sugar in the porridge, right? So you can't reject it on that basis. There's nothing in the definition of a scientist that requires you to believe in evolution or creation for that matter, although I would argue science has a basis in creation. So that's a no true Scotsman fallacy. And I could go on and on, and I have, uh, I've written books on this. I'll mention some of them at the end. But it's very helpful to know these fallacies because they come up all the time in arguments against creation or the Christian worldview helpful to know them, and it's helpful to know the name, too. It just somehow it gives it a little more persuasive power. If you know the name of it, you can say, well, actually, that's the fallacy of such and such, and, and here's why that doesn't work. You want to do it graciously, but you should, we should point out that when somebody has made a bad argument against Scripture for their own benefit. So arguments against the Bible, they're always inherently fallacious. The Bible is the word of truth. It's the word of God. It's not going to have errors in it, and therefore, um, any argument against it must be fallacious. But what's interesting to me is that rationality itself presupposes the Christian worldview. In other words, if the Christian worldview were not true, if the universe and man were not the way the Bible says they are, then it wouldn't make sense to have laws of logic at all. I mean, laws of logic are the rules of correct reasoning, but who decides what's correct? Now, see, I have an answer to that. God does. God decides what's correct. But if you don't have God, then it's every man for himself. In which case, it's not really laws of logic anymore. It's just your own opinion. Laws of logic are the rules that govern all correct reasoning. And if we think about what they are, and I mentioned one earlier, the law of non-contradiction, which says you can't have A and not A at the same time and in the same sense. Okay? Contradiction. Two contradictory statements all, always have the opposite truth value. So when you combine them, it's always false. Now, if we think about what they are in terms of what are laws of logic, are they something you can step on? No, are they something you can uh, pull out of a refrigerator or accidentally swallow? No, they're abstract, right? They're abstract, they exist in the mind. You can think a law of logic, but you can't stub your toe on one. They're universal, which means they apply everywhere, 
right? We assume uh, if you go to a new place that you've never been before, you don't walk in thinking, boy, I sure hope laws of logic work here, right? The astronauts who went to the moon, they were cons there were a lot of issues they had to overcome, a lot of engineering problems. They were worried about a lot of things, but one thing they were not worried about was, gee, I hope laws of logic work on the moon. Otherwise, we might die and not die. <laughs> No, they're universal. They apply everywhere. They apply on Mars. They apply in the Andromeda Galaxy. If I go to a new place that I've never been before, I'm confident laws of logic will work there. They are universal. They apply everywhere. They're invariant, meaning they don't change with time. It's not like, well, laws of laws work on Friday, sure, but on Saturday, hey, everything's... No, no, no. It's not like, it's not like oh, contradictions are true on Saturdays, but not on Fridays. They have, an, they have a, an invariant nature to them, an unchanging quality to them, and they are exceptionless. It's not, that, it's not that laws of logic work most of the time, but every now and then two contradictory statements can be true. No, they are exceptionless. And of course, they're laws of correct reasoning. Now, from a Christian worldview, I can explain every one of these and how I know about it. Because you see, this is the, the laws of logic, I would argue, are a reflection of the way God thinks. Laws of logic are abstract because uh, they're, they're, they're non-material, and I can have non-material things in my worldview because God is non-material. He's not made up of atoms. He created the universe, the material universe. So he's not bound by it. They're universal because God's, God's omnipresent. His power is immediately available everywhere in the universe. He's sovereign over the entire universe, and so his thinking determines truth everywhere. They're invariant, why? Because God does not change with time, right? He says, I do not change, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change in terms of his divine nature, and therefore his thinking does not change. I realize there are places in the Bible where you know, it indicates, well, God changed his mind, but that's in response to human conditions. God says, if you do this, this is what I'm going to do. If you do that, that's what I'm going to do. And people say, oh, well, let's do that. And so God follows through. His thinking hasn't really changed, and therefore laws of logic do not change. And they're exceptionless because God is absolutely sovereign over all truth. All truth is in the mind of God, Colossians 2, 3. All truth. And therefore, there are no exceptions to laws of correct reasoning. See, I can make sense of these things. And I can tell you why I know that laws of logic are universal. Because the Bible tells me that that's the nature of God. God's omnipresent. I can tell you why laws of logic are invariant. Because God is timeless. He's beyond time. He created time. So, of course, he's beyond it. I can explain all of those in the Christian worldview, but can a secularist? These things stem from the nature of God, and I want to in particular point out the law of non-contradiction. You can't have A and not A at the same time in the same sense. That stems from God's nature. 2 Timothy 2.13, 2, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. There are some things God cannot do. When we say God's all-powerful, we mean he can do anything he wants to do, but there are some things he would never want to do, like contradict himself, because that's contrary to his nature. He is self-consistent. And in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If all truth is in God and God doesn't deny himself, that means truth can't deny itself, can it? There's your law of non-contradiction. Now, it's interesting to me because unbelievers do use laws of logic. But when they do that, they're stealing from the Christian worldview. Because it's only the Christian worldview that can explain laws of logic and those properties and how we know about those properties. I mean, there might be an atheist out there who says, well, I just think there are laws of logic and I think they're universal. How do you know that? Have you been everywhere in the universe to check? That's blind faith, isn't it? You just, for some reason, you just think they're universe. That's irrational. He doesn't have a good reason for that. But the Christian worldview, I can make sense of that. Naturalism is the belief that nature is all that there is. There's no God, or if there is a God, he's sort of within nature. Everything that exists is matter and energy. Now, the naturalist will attempt to use logic to convince others of his position, but he's got a problem because logic is not made of atoms. Logic is not matter or energy, it's conceptual. And so if his universe is only matter and energy, there can't be laws of logic in it. That's interesting. And yet he tries to use logic to convince other people of his position. He's using something that cannot exist in his worldview, his professed worldview. And he, he's able to use logic because he's made in the image of God too, and he knows in his heart of hearts the biblical God, he's just rejected that God. The way to think about it is like this. The, the unbeliever cannot stand on his own worldview because you can't get laws of logic that are universal, abstract, exceptionless, work everywhere, right, that, uh, in a secular universe. It doesn't make any sense. But he needs laws of logic, so he's got to borrow them from the Christian worldview, 
Christian presuppositions. He's not going to like that. I'm going to point out to you, look, fellow, you're, you're standing on God's ground. You're a presuppositional kleptomaniac. You're stealing, from God's, you're stealing from God's property. You either need to get saved or stop trespassing. We hope you'll get saved, but that's between you and God. We're just here to point out the inconsistency. Now, he's not going to like that. He's going, no, no, laws of logic, those are, those are not Christian. Those are secular. I can use those. You can only use those because you're made in the image of God. It, it, it make no sense. Laws of logic make no sense in a secular worldview. Why would you have rules of correct reasoning if we're all just chemical accidents? That makes no sense. If there's, there's no standard. What are some possible responses to this? There aren't many, but I'll give you a few that I've heard because I've been using this for a long time. Some people have said, well, laws of logic are material. They're the chemical reactions that exist in your brain. So they are made up of atoms. So I can have laws of logic in my materialistic universe. No, because the chemical reactions in my brain are not exactly the same as the chemical reactions in your brain. They're different. So if laws of logic were just chemical reactions, first of all, they wouldn't be laws. They wouldn't extend outside your brain. There'd be no reason to assume that they work elsewhere, right? Because my brain's right here, and that's all, that's all it is. And, they, and nobody could have the same laws of logic because we all have different chemical reactions in our brain. See, in the Christian worldview, the brain is only part of the mind. We have an immaterial aspect to our character as well. In, and our, no, no, no doubt our brain helps in our thinking, but we have a spirit as well. And I can, I can make sense of having these laws that have been given to me by God, and I can learn more of them by studying and thinking th things through. But in a secular worldview, that makes no sense. If, if laws of logic are material, they're not laws. And there'd be no, there'd be no reason to think that they don't change, because the chemical reactions in your brain change over time. They do, whether you like it or not. Laws of logic says, well, maybe they're not material, but they're descriptions of how the brain thinks. So that's, that's my answer. They, you, see, you don't need to be a Christian. They're just descriptions of how the brain thinks. That's not going to work, because if laws of logic were descriptions of how the brain thinks, then why would we need laws of logic to correct the way the brain thinks? Because we don't always think rightly, and we need laws of logic to fix that, right? And we all think a little differently. So we'd all have different laws of logic if that were true, but that doesn't work, right? It's not like some people, for some people, the law of non-contradiction, you know, it doesn't exist. They can contradict themselves, and it's true. That's not going to work. They would lose their law-like status. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be universal or invariant or any of those things if they were just descriptions of how the brain thinks. This one stumps people because it's close to the truth. The truth is they are descriptions of how God thinks. And God never needs to be corrected, but we do. We don't always think like God. That's our problem. That's why we need laws of logic. But it can't be descriptions of how we think. Otherwise, you could never break a law of logic because you always think the way that you think, don't you? Somebody says they're conventions. They're conventions. A convention is something that we all agree on it and it kind of works, right? Like driving on the right side of the road. That's a convention. And we all agree to that. It works pretty well. Laws of logic are like that. We, you know, we, we, we agree these are the rules and we shake hands and we all use them and things work out pretty well. But if they were conventions, then different cultures could adopt different laws of logic. You go to Australia, everybody drives on the left side of the road. And they all agree to that and it works. So if laws of logic were like that, you go to different countries, they'd have different laws of logic, wouldn't they? Welcome to Australia. Here, contradictions are true. Contradict yourself. Go right ahead. You have to. That doesn't make any sense. Again, they wouldn't be laws if they were just conventions. Uh, somebody says, well, they're just a property of the universe. They're, they're just, they reflect the way the universe is. That's really hard to defend because laws of logic really are not about the universe. Laws of nature, you could maybe make that argument, but laws of logic, no. Because laws of logic aren't about the universe. They're about correct reasoning. When I say a uh, proposition has the opposite truth value of its negation, what aspect of the universe am I talking about? Nothing, right? Because I'm, ta I'm talking in terms of abstract language. It's not, there's nothing physical that that applies to. It's a true statement. So it's not a property of the universe. And by the way, the universe is always changing. It's expanding. Stars explode. You'd expect laws of logic would change if they were a reflection of a changing universe. But they're not really about the universe. And so that response doesn't make any sense. One guy told me this. He said, we use them because they work. That's the fallacy of a relevant thesis, because that's not the question I'm asking. I know they work. I'm asking, how can you make sense of them in a non-Christian worldview? He says, well, they work. I know they work, because Christianity is true. But how could you possibly make sense of them, their existence, their properties, how we know about them in your worldview, apart from the, the Christian God? See, if he turns that around and says, well, how do you know about them? I says, because I've, I've read the Bible. I've read the, the book written by my Lord. He used people to write it, but it's his word. 
He tells us something about his nature. He's, he's omnipresent. He doesn't change with time. And, and I know something about how he thinks because I've read his book. So I can answer that. But the secularist can't. See, fallacy of, the fallacy of irrelevant thesis is tricky. It's one that fools a lot of people because a lot of times it answers something, it says something that's true, but it's not the answer to the question you're asking. Okay? So if, uh, you know, if, there, if I came into this room and there was a Volkswagen here, I said, wow, that's interesting. H how did this get in here? And somebody says, well, it works. <laughs> that doesn't answer my question, does it? Okay, it works, fine. How did they get in here? That doesn't answer my question. We use them because they work does not answer my question. How can you make sense of them in your worldview? So it's really interesting. The, <clears throat> the secularists will stand on Christian presuppositions like laws of logic and will use those Christian presuppositions to argue against the Christian position. Now, if he were hypothetically successful in showing that the Bible had a contradiction or something like that, using laws of logic to disprove scripture, which he can't really do, but if he were to do that, he would lose the ground on which he must stand to make the argument. Because apart from the, the word of God, there's no basis for the law of non-contradiction. Somebody says, well, I've never seen true contradictions. I'll say, I've never seen Antarctica. Does that mean it doesn't exist? Hmm. I mean, your experiences, con considering the universe, your experiences are pretty tiny. Most of you have never even left the planet. And it's a big universe. So how can you make these universal claims that laws of logic work everywhere? How do you know that? See, he has to stand on Christian ground to get his laws of logic to then argue against Christianity. And if you recognize that, boy, that's powerful. That is really powerful because that'll put an end to any argument. Because people are going to try to, uh, people that try to argue against the Bible try to use logic to do it. But they don't have any basis for logic apart from the Christian worldview. If you understand that principle, it is powerful. I've never had anybody be able to come back from that. That doesn't mean they necessarily convert, but it, it, they, they can't make a counter argument. So, Every Christian should strive to be rational for three reasons. We've seen that we do have a moral obligation to be rational. You should think rightly, not in an attempt to earn salvation. You can't earn salvation, but out of gratitude for salvation. We should try to think like God because it's something that he wants us to do. He made us in his image. We should reflect his character, and we should reflect it in the way we think and in the way we behave. Rationality, we've seen it has many practical benefits. Your life's going to go better, generally, if you're thinking right. Your, your theology is going to go better. You're going to tend to draw correct conclusions. Maybe not all the time, but more often than not, if you're thinking rightly. And rationality is essential in apologetics, and we've seen two reasons for that. Because first of all, arguments against the Bible always have a fallacy in them or start from a false premise. Always. There's no good argument against Scripture. And then uh, secondly, because rationality itself presupposes the truthfulness of the Christian worldview. That the, that the Bible is right in what it says about the character and nature of God, the character of the universe, the character of man, the fact that God has revealed himself to man, all of those are essential in order for us to know that there are laws of logic and to be able to use them and to describe them. Uh, would you speak to how um, logic relates to the mysteries, the great mysteries of Christian faith, like the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, because those are... Uh, they seem like contradictions, but of course they're not. Right. right. Yeah, and we get that a lot, and it's, it's good to know that. It's good to know how to answer that. Uh, because when we say that uh, Jesus is fully God and fully man, that's true. It's not a contradiction, though, because there's nothing in the nature of God that prevents him from taking on the nature of man. They're not contrary. Um, another example would be the, tr the Trinity. Um, let, let me back up. If I were to say that Jesus is God and not God, that would be a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction to say that Jesus is God and man. Because man does not necessarily, even though all other human beings, all other men are not God, there's nothing that says that God cannot take on that nature. So there's, no, there's nothing contradictory. Remember, contradiction is A and not A at the same time and in the same sense. So we can say Jesus is fully God and fully man without contradiction. Likewise with the Trinity, uh, we're not saying God is one in the same sense in which he's three. He's, he's one in the sense that he's one being. He's three in the sense of persons. And of course, we can distinguish between those, those terms on the basis of scriptures. There's only one all-powerful being, that's God. There are three persons that partake of that one nature, that one God. So, um, and so we can make sense of that in the Christian worldview. It's, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean you can picture it, but that's not required. There are certain mathematical truths I cannot picture 
like the fact that the perimeter of the Mandelbrot set is infinite. It's infinitely wiggly. I can't, I can't even fathom what that means. But I can demonstrate that it's true. And it's the same way with the Christian faith. There's nothing in there that's, there's nothing in there that's contrary to logic because God is the source of logic. So the Trinity, there's no contradiction there. God is not one in the same sense in which he's three. Okay? Thank you. Uh, I have a number of resources. We have them out front. I hope you'll pick up some of these. One book that goes along with this talk very well, it's called Introduction to Logic. I wrote this really to be a, uh, really to be a curriculum. I, uh, homeschoolers, I hope, will pick this up and use it. But uh, most adults have not been taught logic because most of us have gone through public schools and we haven't, we haven't had an introduction to logic, really. So it'd be good for adults to pick up as well. If you do want to use it as a um, curriculum, there's a teacher's guide you can get as well. It has tests and quizzes. I wrote the teacher's guide as well, so it's, uh, so it's good. It's really good. <laughs> and, uh, discerning truth is, uh, if you just want a re real short introduction to what are the top 10 fallacies that evolutionists uh, tend to make when they argue against creation. That's what I primarily do is I defend biblical creation. I defend Genesis. And I've noticed that evolutionists make a lot of mistakes in reasoning. You can read that in an afternoon, okay? It's, it's easy. Easy read, and it's got, I think it's got some quizzes in the back, too, where you can test yourself, and along with an answer key. Ultimate proof of creation. I'll be talking about this tomorrow morning, but I, I wanted to mention it because there are two chapters in here on logic. When I, when I was giving this, what I believe is a bulletproof argument for biblical creation, really for the biblical worldview as a whole, uh, I thought, boy, it's important that people know a little bit about the basics of logic. And so there's a chapter on informal logic and a chapter on formal logic. And Understanding Genesis also has an appendix on logic, even though the book really is more about how to interpret Scripture and how does the Bible tell us to interpret Scripture. Yes, the Bible gives us some instructions on how it should be interpreted. And uh, the book goes through and kind of discovers what that has to be and applies these to Genesis to show you that, yeah, God really did mean what he said when he said that he created in six days and there was a global flood. He really meant it. You can trust it. I have a DVD on that as well, Understanding Genesis. Uh, Keeping Faith in Age of Reason, I'll, I'll list this one. It's, a, it's a, one of my more popular books. It answers over 400 alleged Bible contradictions. There was this list circulating on the internet that, you know, you Christians, man, you're foolish because look at all these contradictions in the Bible and had a list of 400 contradictions, 400 plus contradictions. And, uh, and of course, it doesn't say why they're contradictory. It just lists the verse. So this contradicts that. This verse contradicts that. And I said, okay, I'm gonna call your bluff. I'll go through and look, and I, and I answered every one of them in that book. Not one of them is a legitimate contradiction, not one. I would expect that. Uh, several of them were fallacies, logical fallacies. Uh, keep in mind, a contradiction is A and not A at the same time and in the same sense, okay? Sometimes the sense is different. Sometimes the time is different. They'll say this verse contradicts, this one says this city's uninhabited. Here there's lots of people in it. Yeah, they're two different times. <laughs> a city can be uninhabited at one time and be inhabited at another time. So anyway, the book uh, goes through and answers those. There were only a few that I had to go back to the original language. Sometimes you have to do that. You have to go back to the Hebrew and Greek and really kind of dissect it. And that was kind of fun because I'm, I'm a nerd. I like that. Um, I do have to point out you can get a lot of our best resources, all the books together for a discount, 20% discount with our book pack. And we have a DVD uh, pack as well, a video pack, 20% uh, off. You can get them all together or you can get the best books and DVDs in our library pack. That's a nice way to have an instant creation library. And we only do these at conferences, so you can get them on the website too, but you'll pay more. Do sign up for our free monthly newsletter, and uh, you, you'll find that out there. Make sure you put your email. It's an electronic newsletter, so do put your email or you'll get nothing. So do, do sign up for that. Check us out on the web as well, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. That's a free resource for you. Please check us out on that website. Lots of wonderful articles on there, and uh, all, all for your free consumption. So thank you very much.